Welcome and thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began in 2000. Through these monthly conversations, we will bring you firsthand accounts of survival. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. For many of you, it may be helpful to define the Holocaust. It was a systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its allies and collaborators. The Nazis who came to power in Germany in January, 1933, believed that Germans were racially superior and that the Jews were inferior and a threat to the so-called German racial community. Holocaust survivors are those who were displaced, persecuted, or discriminated against due to the racial, religious, ethnic, social, and political policies of the Nazis and their collaborators between 1933 and 1945. This included inmates of concentration camps, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees and those in hiding. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Dora Clayman share her individual account of the Holocaust with us. During our program, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining us from in the live chat. Dora, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Many thanks. Um, I am very honored to be able to uh, speak to the audience um, in front of us and um, it's unusual that we are actually able to speak to um, many people who are all over the place and I welcome you all and I'm glad to be able to share some of my story. Dora, thank you so much. You, you, you have so much to share with us and we have limited time so we'll start. Please begin by telling us when and where you were born and a few details about your early life. Uh, I was born in Zagreb, what at that time was Yugoslavia in January of 1938. Um, it was still a very peaceful time, of course, um, much before war reached that part of the world. And um, there is a picture that I'd like to share of my parents. Um, so at this point, I was already two years old. And uh, this is a picture of my parents uh, with me um, in front of the Zagreb Zoo. And I think it's still there, should you go and visit. Uh, my mother uh, was um, actually not from Zagreb. She was born uh, daughter of a rabbi, of the rabbi of the small town of Ludbreg in um, what is in, uh, in Northern Croatia. Uh, and um, she became a teacher of uh, elementary school teacher, taught for a bit of time, and then married my father and came to Zagreb. My father, uh, the family originally also came um, from originally from Romania via Bosnia and then established its, itself in Zagreb. And my father learned um, all about brush making and established a small factory of brushes uh, in Zagreb proper. Um, he must have been visiting Ludbreg um, at one point, uh, probably as a visiting cantor uh, for a holiday, just for the holidays. And the two of them met and um, married, uh, moved to Zagreb and um, had um, first uh, me and then eventually uh, my little brother. Um, Dory, you, you, um, you spent a lot of time in your mother's hometown of Ludbrig and eventually you would spend the war years there. Will you share with us a little about uh, Ludbrig and, and what was unique about it? Uh, well, I don't know how unique it was, but it's a small town. Uh, these days, they th the, the interesting thing about Ludbrig these days, and if anybody from Ludbrig hears it, they will uh, agree. They think they're in the center of the world, but that's sort of an in, inside joke. Um, um, they, it's a small town um, in a basically rural area, and... Um, I had before the war a, a small Jewish population, not um, anything grand as a synagogue, but there was a synagogue. And um, at one point, uh, the um, community uh, asked um, 
wanted to have a rabbi come. And my grandfather arrived from uh, Slovakia. Um, and I will explain the picture in a minute, but uh, he came from Slovakia already uh, with his family. Uh, he already had one daughter and a son, and then uh, another daughter was born and eventually my mother. Um, Wilbrecht was an interesting town in that, um, in that small population, there was um, very little to no friction, um, of anti-Semitic friction, I mean. Um, and um, there were very few incidents in during that time. My grandfather uh, was actually um, uh, a, a rabbi there for 42 years by the time um, war ended his um, leadership there. Here is... Uh, the picture is interesting because my grandfather uh, is the person with the circle around his head. And um, um, so just to identify him from the other clergyman at the other end, the other clergyman is the local Catholic priest. Um, Ludwig is, was a practically um, totally Catholic world, but in, as this picture shows, there was particip participation within the school. This is the um, middle school faculty pictured here. And my grandfather apparently taught Jewish children um, their religion, and there was a Catholic priest that, um, that taught um, uh, Catholic children. Um, my grandfather participated in many other things, um, civic, civic things in town, acted as a translator, for example, um, for, for the court. He spoke a number of languages. So, uh, so here you have um, both a, a rabbi and a priest on the faculty of the public school, right. um, which, which, yeah, I would, I would think that that would have been very unique at the time. Along the same lines, I think we have another photograph that uh, you want to talk about, Dora. Yes, this other photograph is of the local uh, tennis club at that time. Um, and um, the uh, lady with the circle around uh, her head is the oldest daughter of whom I spoke, who was actually born in Slovakia and came. And um, again, um, the fellow above her with a, with a circle is a Ludwa Vrancic, who played a very large role in my in my uh, world, and uh, he um, is totally Catholic from a well-known um, uh, old-time uh, semi-aristocratic family of Ludbreg. The mother was of an aristocratic background, um, and there are other uh, Jewish and non-Jewish people in this picture, which mm -hmm. also shows. Uh, the um, social participation, social interaction between groups. Um, the reason I wanted to particularly point to Ludwig Vrancic with the circle is that he and my aunt uh, worked together in the bank. He eventually was a director of the bank and she worked there. And and this is your, this is your aunt Giza, right, Dora? That's my aunt Giza. Aunt and Giza. the two of them fell in love. Okay. And they were in love for a long time here is where they're older together. And um, he was very special in that he was um, well known in that town as a one time mayor. Um, he, the, the tennis club, he was one of the organizers and uh, founders of the, uh, of the, in 1919, I think, of the sports club of, of Woodbreg and had one of the first automobiles in town. Um, in, in Croatia, in fact. Uh, he was very proud of this lunch uh, automobile. And the two of them were in love for a long time, but they did not marry, probably because of the difference of religion. And in Croatia, in Yugoslavia at that time, there was no such thing as a civil marriage. You either had to uh, marry in a Jewish or in a Catholic faith, and neither was converting, and so, it's not until 1939 that they married. At that time, they of course became aware of what was going on in Germany. The, uh, the war had started in, um, with the, um, already with the invasion of Poland and um, they decided, um, having heard that perhaps a, um, 
non-Jewish um, a partner could save uh, a spouse who was Jewish, they decided to go to Hungary where a civil ceremony was possible and they were married. And, and of course, as you just said, they had hoped that it would um, help save your Aunt Giza's life. And as, as you'll tell us later, that, that was not right. to be. Dora, before we continue, I'd like to um, uh, share with you that we have viewers joining us from all kinds of different places here in the United States from Ohio, Texas, Arizona, and California. And we have some schools. Uh, so we have the whole classrooms or the whole school, including Hopewell Elementary School in Iowa. And we have international viewers from Argentina, Mexico, and Canada. So lots of people from everywhere are watching you today. Dora, you. World War II began in September, 1939, but it really did not reach you until Germany invaded Yugoslavia on April 6, 1941. You were just three years old at that time, and you were away from Zagreb on a visit with relatives in Ludbreg. Please tell us why you were away from your parents and what happened once the Germans came into Yugoslavia. Um, <clears throat> there was a time that, uh, that, uh, re that neighbors of my grandparents came to visit us in Zagreb and my mother and father probably thought it would be a good opportunity to send me to go visit uh, my grandparents but in addition at that point mother um, we uh, um, my brother was already born my brother was born ex almost exactly three years after me uh, in January of 1941. So here was a three-year-old uh, that could be sent away for a bit of time, um, for a bit of respite, I would imagine. And so I was sent to Ludbreg. Um, and, and here we see your mother with your baby brother. Mother, right. Right. Um, yeah. And um, so, at, in, so by, by the time uh, April 6th of 41 came, uh, I was still in Ludbreg and uh, basically stayed there. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, of course, um, with the invasion is that um, not only did Yugoslavia fall um, uh, and basically fell apart within a very short period of time in just days, um, and um, the uh, Germany basically overran uh, in, in uh, Yugoslavia. But uh, what happened at the same time, or actually was happening previous to that, is that there was a group um, of right-wing nationalist, ultra-nationalist, um, terrorist group of Ustashe, which had tried to get uh, a foothold uh, in Yugoslavia before, but never managed to do so. And they instead went to Italy, organized themselves into a force uh, with, this, with, with the uh, help of um, Mussolini, of course. And uh, they made a, an arrangement with um, Germany uh, that uh, they would want to have a nationalist a c country of Croatia, which they would run um, with a tacit approval of Germany. And that is what happened. Um, here is a picture of uh, Ante Pavelic, who was at the head of this Ustasha group. And uh, this is, um, and he's um, <clears throat> here pictured with Hitler who came to visit. And this was a little, a little bit later. Um, in the time that that the, that Ustasha were already totally running the country, in what Ustasha did, they established something they called the Independent State of Croatia. And and Dora, um, as you said, they were a puppet state of of the Nazi Germany, and they adopted their own set of laws uh, for Croatia. Uh, that were mirrored on the Nuremberg laws of Germany, right? And and, and those were incredibly restrictive. Exactly. Basically, Jews were now restricted to second uh, <coughs> uh, to, to secondhand non-citizenship, basically. Um, 
but it wasn't just the Jews. It was um, just like in Germany, um, other groups were um, singled out. Um, and uh, in this case, um, it was also Roma, just like in Germany. But in addition, within, within Croatia, there were also um, laws and um, persecutions uh, against Serbs. Now, Serbs were a fairly large, fairly uh, sizable minority within Croatia, and um, they, um, they were a um, subject of persecution by Ustasha, who wanted to have when they called the independent state of Croatia, it wasn't independent, of course, and it was um, organized so that they could persecute Serbs and make Croatia totally Croatian and totally Catholic. Uh, so if I could jump in for just a quick minute, I want to, uh, I'm going to interject here that a, one of your friends is watching and they specifically want to say hi to you. Marian Hahn met with her students at Peabody and she says, so good to see you again. And thank you for sharing your story, Dora. Well, Marian is a wonderful, wonderful pianist, and um, people should uh, listen to her uh, music online. I'm sure that it's available. She is a professor of piano at Peabody. Yes. So, Dora, the Ustasha is in control, as you said. Your your brother and your parents are in Zagreb, and you're in Ludbreg. What did that mean now for your parents? What happened next? Well, what it meant for the Jewish population generally is that they uh, were now uh, subject to all these discriminatory laws. That meant, um, as you see in the picture, they had to wear an identifying badge. So they're all wearing this yellow badge. This is my parents and my aunt, my, um, my mother's sister-in-law and my little cousin Edita. And they're wearing badges that have this um, Magan David on them, the, the Star of David, and a letter Z with a little the critical mark over it. It makes it into Z, which means Zidov in Croatian, which means Jew. So they had to wear this at all times and everybody, that including even very little children. Um, it also meant a loss of ability to have jobs in the government or jobs, good jobs anywhere, um, loss of ability to um, attend university and a large amount of, uh, of, um, of confiscation. So everybody had to declare of what they owned. And actually, uh, at, the, uh, at um, the Holocaust Museum here, I saw uh, facsimiles of uh, uh, forms that they had to fill out, which the, my, even my cousins had to fill out. They had little things like as one spring coat and one winter coat and then and and then bracelet and then, and then one little chain everything everything had to be declared so that it could be confiscated um so even even children had to fill out these lists of what they owned well the parents of course the parents did, did for them, them yeah. Yes. Yeah. but it was it had to be all filled out everything had to be declared so that it could be confiscated um and, and dora of course it wouldn't be long before your parents were also arrested and taken. That that happened fairly soon. Tell us tell us what happened. Um, well, um, as as I mentioned before, I I was in Bilberg and I actually remained with my grandparents. But my parents in Zagreb. This is where the deportation started, and so by the time by fall that year, uh, they were arrested and. Um, they were being held in a, a transfer transfer point, um, a, a place where where they, everybody was being held, and then we transferred to the trains to be to be sent to to camp. Um, and uh, my mother had uh, my baby brother with her. Of course, uh, he was only about nine months old at the time. Um, but 
ha what was very lucky at the time, and of course extremely difficult for my parents, is um, that a housekeeper of ours went to the camp and talked to the camp, and she was of course Catholic, and she, she talked to the um, guards and asked if she could have my brother. And my mother must have been a fairly difficult thing, but she understood that it might save his life. She handed the baby to uh, to our housekeeper, who then um, went home, called my now Catholic uncle Ludwa and my aunt in um, in Ludbreg, and they came and got him. And I have a fairly vivid memory. At that point, I was almost four, or three, and, mm -hmm. yeah, three and three quarters, and I I remember his arrival. Um, mainly because I wasn't used to a crying baby and there he was and I hadn't seen him for quite a while. And um, also I remember very soon after it was winter time and then it was Hanukkah and I sort of remember that time, um, not only the candles, uh, but I remember getting an orange for Hanukkah and that was very special. Um, and um, I was um, sort of wondering whether I have to share it with my baby brother. I sort of remember that. Uh, Dora, I want to remind our audience that uh, we'd like them to please share their questions that they have of you and to do that via the chat feature here. Uh, so please do share those questions for us. Dora, as you said, uh, the deportations began in Zagreb, including your parents. In 1942, deportations began from Ludbreg as well. And most of your extended family was deported. Tell us what you remember about those deportations of your own family members. That was that was a very difficult time. Um, uh, this was 42, so I was already old enough that I do have some memory of it. Uh, I, that I, I remember that I was in my aunt and my Catholic uncle's um, uh, house by that point. And um, I remember it was sort of evening and everybody was coming by, all my cousins and my aunt and my grandparents, and everybody was saying goodbye to me. And I wasn't quite sure, I don't, why, would, why everybody was crying, but obviously um, they had the feeling that they wouldn't see me, see us again. And I had no idea where they were heading exactly. Um, so it was, it was a very um, emotionally laden time and um, they were taken away and they went. Uh, and all the deportations were happening uh, quite a bit. I think that we have a picture of the deportation. Um, this picture is from the museum, from the Memorial, uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. And it's a picture of, of a Serb village being deported. Um, as I mentioned before, the Ustasha were not just uh, eager to um, uh, deport and kill Jews and Roma, but also Serbs. And uh, they deported whole villages and many were shot on the way or shot every which way, uh, killed every which way. But some of them, just like our my relatives, ended up instead in the uh, in the camp, most in camps, mostly in the camp of Yasanovats. Which was actually in Croatia. And we're going to come back to that. Dora, I do have a question for you from an audience member, Manel. She asks, do you know where your parents were deported to once they left that transfer camp? Yes. Yes, definitely. They, they went into the very camp that I was just about to speak about. Okay which is a camp Yasenovac. There was some feeling that my mother may have gone to um, uh, Saragradishka, I think she did, and maybe to Jakovo, which is another place uh, that was a horrendous place um, where many women and children especially were killed. And um, I actually went there two years ago. Um, um, it's a sort of a, um, a, a another reminder, but uh, mostly they went to Yasenovac. It was a um, the the biggest of the camps, and it was a uh, most horrific camp. Um, and be, be, before you tell us more about that, as I know you will, 
um, you, as you, as you said, the, uh, uh, the Ustasha was, was deporting and brutalizing not just Jews, but also Serbs and Roma. But you also shared with me that not everyone, not, not everyone in the Croatia um, accepted those policies or the Ustasha, and some, in fact, resisted. Tell us a little bit about that resistance. Who, who were they? Uh, uh, yes, many people did not uh, follow um, the uh, dictates of the of the Ustasha regime um, uh, at at or in peril, of course. Um, joined uh, a group that was that was basically led first by the by a group of communists uh, who were more organized uh, even at that time uh, than the general population, and then. Um, uh, the person who was um, who became fairly well known later on, and people may recognize the name, was Tito. Uh, but um, uh, basically, people ran into the mountains and, and organized themselves, and eventually uh, became quite a force. And uh, at, at the end, toward the end, they became actually a, a a formidable military force. With and, and you, you'll tell us a little bit more about those partisans and how it really directly affected your life in a in a in a big way. Dora, you you're you're now in Ludbreg still. You're with your aunt Giza and your uncle Ludva. Uh, your uncle Ludva, however, was arrested in 1943, and and the Ustasha sent him to the Asenovets camp um, as well. Tell us why your uncle, who was, was a Catholic, why he would have been arrested and sent uh, to Yasenovets and what, and what conditions were like in Yasenovets. You've told us a, just a little bit about it. Tell us some more and also tell us about what it was like for your uncle. Okay, so uh, the reason for my uncle's arrest was had to do with the partisans because uh, as I said, they became a formidable force that fought the uh, the Ustasha, um, uh forces, and um, the the fighting um, was fairly uh, frequent and fairly um, fierce uh, in Ludbreg. And uh, two times during the war, we were actually liberated for a period of time. Uh, at one of those liberation, when the Ustasha returned, um, they 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 weren't uh, going to be just sitting down and saying, "Well, this is what happened." They actually wanted to find some scapegoats. They didn't lose just because the partisans were uh, <clears throat> stronger, but there must have been some help from within. And so they arrested some leaders of that town, um, about five of them, and they sent them. To the to to the same concentration camp to the Asenovats that included my uncle. Um, I didn't mention before, but uh, he came from a family that that had um, uh, had fairly um, um, fairly uh, uh, frequent. Uh, deaths uh, in that um, number of his sisters and brothers died young of uh, uh, tuberculosis as such. Mm -hmm. So he himself was not a terribly strong person. So going to a concentration camp would have been uh, terrible because this concentration camp was a killing camp. It was a place where people were, oh, this picture shows them just on the way in being stripped of uh, all possessions. And um, it was a camp in which um, uh, people were killed at will um, with any kind of implements, knives being their Ustasha favorite. Uh, people were hanged, they were tortured, they were thrown in the river. Um, the river Sava was um, full of floating bodies at one point. Uh, there are pictures of that um, in the, our museum, actually. Um, so it was a horrendous camp. People were starved to death and worked to death. Uh, so um, my uncle arriving there um, um, would have been very difficult uh, for him um, to survive. Um, I didn't mention before, but um, 
um, my grand my my all my family ended up there except eventually for Aunt Giza, but everybody from Ludbreg ended up there and I was told by eyewitnesses that my grandfather never even made it into the camp proper but one of the Ustasha just hit him on the head with a shovel and killed him that way so you know, Dora, Dora I, I, I was struck the first time you told me about Yasanovets and that the, the brutality and and I'm sure that many in our audience probably most just like me that was a place we had never even heard of and yet it was just and you're only just touching on the surface for your for your uncle Ludva however because he was frail um, he had a little bit of a little bit of good fortune in what they decided very to do with so. Yes, very much so, because they found out, they knew that he was uh, a banker and also that he um, was a uh, amateur um, violinist and that he had organized an orchestra in Ludbreg, a small orchestra and, and a choir, and they put on performances and they knew that. And so they used him in that way. So, um, the, he was he was then put in an office to uh, to run the paperwork mm -hmm. and that of course saved him because the rest of the world was out there uh, in in cold and any kind of inclement weather without practically without shelter and with almost no food um, and working very hard. My father, he, my father was there, and my uncle Ludwig actually saw him there. Uh, he he actually survived to the very end. Um, and he uh, he was working in a in a factory in a tannery, which was very hard work. There was also a factory that pre created chains. This were this was awful hard work. But my uncle was being put in was put in an office, and um, there was someone kind there that that went, that sometimes helped a little, and also he was ordered to put. Um, on a performance, and so he he used to tell me afterwards that he would take everybody that he could think of um, into the group, and um, uh, so they would have at least some time indoors to to practice singing instead of um, instead of freezing or or working out outdoors. So the, um, the fact that the Ustasha wanted to be entertained, and they they took advantage of the fact that your 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 uncle could play music, but he used that as an opportunity to try to save others by having them join him, yes. Yes, very did, much so. Dora, did, did, were you, was Aunt Giza able to be in touch with your uncle while he was at Yesenefats? Uh, yes, um, uh, he was able to write uh, and he was able to get some packages. Um, uh, and um, the picture you see in front of you is of my Aunt Giza and my brother and me. And um, this is a picture we went to the photographer to have it taken so that we could send it to him. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we sent that and we also used to send some food. And one of the foods that I remember very well, my aunt preparing, is a um, something that uh, we think of as roux in, in cooking in the United States. And I think in Croatia, we used to call it Einbren. And uh, it was a mixture of uh, fat and flour. And she would make a lot of it. So it would be sort of like a brick. Uh, it would be very, very thick and, and hold, held together. And she would send that. And the reason for it was that you could take a little bit of that, a, a sort of a, a walnut size, maybe pea size piece, and put it in the uh, in your what they call soup, which was basically water, mm -hmm. uh, and um, get some caloric value out of it, some mm -hmm. nutritional value. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the things that I remember very well her making and our sending to him. Dora, while your uncle Ludva was at Yasenovets in early 1943, your aunt Giza, who was caring for you and your brother, was turned into the authorities for being Jewish, and she was deported. What, what can you tell us about what happened to Aunt Giza and and why you think you and your brother were able to remain in Ludbreg? Um, it was a very unfortunate thing as I, Ludbreg was uh, a, a, in, a, in a way unique in that uh, people, uh, uh, people 
knew who we were and no one gave us up. No one went ringing the police door at the police door and saying there are some Jewish children there. Um, but, uh, and, and many, many people from that town uh, had relatives, children of their own and so on in joining the partisans. But one time there was one guy and his name was Tramshek. I can't remember wh where he came from actually, but he knew, of, he found out about my aunt and he denounced her. And um, so the Ustashi uh, came to get her. Um, and she, she, she was trying to hide um, and she was running and she grabbed my brother and me on the way and, um, and took us to our next door neighbor. There was a house we owned next door and we had, um, we had a family living there. The family Runyak lived there and it was a simple family. He was a house painter and she was a nurse. Um, who took care of lots of people that suffer from trachoma. And um, they had three children older than we were. And my aunt took us there and said to Mrs. Runyak, please take care of these children. And at that point, the Ustasha caught up with her, but she left us with the Runyak family. Mm -hmm. And they were most kind to accept us because it was pretty dangerous to be harboring Jewish children, especially because uh, at times we had um, we had um, Ustasha bivouacking in our in our backyard. The, the, our house, uh, my uncle's house, and this house actually uh, had the same common backyard. And the Ustasha were settled there, um, literally, literally in your backyard. Literally in your backyard. Literally in our backyard. Yeah. Yes. So of course, I was told by Mrs. Runyak. Uh, we were told to be sure to call her mom uh, if the Ustasha or anybody that we didn't know came into the house. Uh, and I was old enough to, to know when it was somebody we didn't know and when it was somebody friendly that we knew. So I would call her mom, um, mama, when it was important, um, when it was dangerous. And then I would call her Mrs. Runyak when I knew it wasn't dangerous any longer because we were by ourselves. My brother, on the other hand, who was three years younger, never knew the difference, and he called her. Um, he called her mom to the end of the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. Dora, one of our audience members, Callie, asks why that when this man denounced, turned in your aunt Giza, why he didn't do that uh, for you and your brother. <sighs> I don't know. I wish I knew all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably because um, they he the, they didn't want to bother with children. They would have to do something with us because my aunt was taken away. She was she was not sent to Yasanova. She's the only one. She was actually uh, uh, loaded on a train and sent to Auschwitz. And and possibly at that time, whoever was running the place um, wasn't. Um, interested in, in, in dealing with two little children, or I'm not sure uh, whether, but, but whether my aunt was able to deposit us with the Runyak family before the Ustashi came and they didn't realize that we were there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dora Ludva then was released and, and he was released from Yasanovitz and he came home to find that Giza had been deported. What do you remember about his reaction to learning that his wife, your aunt, has been deported? And what do you know about what, what can you tell us about what he did then to protect you and your brother until the end of the war? Um, well, yes, he returned because he had, uh, a, a, as a political prisoner, he actually had a sentence. Um, Jews and Roma and Serbs didn't have sentences. They were just there until until they either died or, or, or were killed uh, or the war ended. Um, but he, the political prisoners, some of them anyway, he had a sentence and he returned. Of course, of course, you're shocked to find his wife gone and finding us. Um, and um, uh, by the way, while, while talking about Yasanovats, I, I do want to mention that in 
you, in former Yugoslavia, in Croatia now, in Serbia, uh, it's referred to often as Jasenovac and not Jasenovac. Uh, I am using the pronunciation that we used in Ludbreg, and that's Kajkovsky view of the world. It's a certain dialect, so um, just so the people understand that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, going to the matter of what happened. Well, my uncle tried to actually follow my aunt's trail uh, where they had taken her and unfortunately if he it had been someplace locally he might have cajoled somebody or something or he at least he hoped so but this was hopeless he was she was at that time they were starting to ship um um the what whoever jews that they could find at that time and serves uh to they were starting to ship people to auschwitz and she was one of them being shipped to Auschwitz. So he returned and took over uh, the care of me and my brother. And um, uh, we lived together for the, from then on. Dora, before we're gonna turn in just a minute to, a, to another question from the audience, but before we do, uh, during that time that you were uh, living, uh, just the two of you, your brother and yourself with Uncle Ludva, you were, you were actually baptized as Christians. Why, why, why was that? And I think we have a picture you want to show. Yeah, right. Um, not a baptismal picture. This is just a picture. But uh, the reason for for the baptism is that um, Mrs. Runyak um, was a you know fairly normal re religious Catholic, um, and some uh, and and had some uh, dealings with the priest, local priest, and the local priest uh, sort of issued a veiled threat like w he knew who th that we were there and we he knew who we were and he said to her uh what about those children and um that was by the way reported to me exactly in those words from mm -hmm. from mrs runyak's uh oldest daughter um much much after the war after everybody else was gone fairly recently whilst mm -hmm. he was still alive uh, anyway, he she he said, "What is going to you know? What's going to be with these children?" And so they, the, uh, my uncle decided that perhaps one of the thing to do would be to to baptize us. So the two of us were baptized in um, 1944. And Dora, before we come back to talk a little bit more about what life was like for you uh, at towards the end of the war with the battles raging between the partisans and the Ustasha, like you shared with us earlier, we're gonna bring in a video question from Lacey, who is a student, a sophomore, in fact, at Geneseo High School. Hi, I'm Lacey. I'm a sophomore at Geneseo High School. My question is, what was life like afterwards? And what was the hardest part about readjusting to life after liberation? So, uh, just to repeat that question so that you hear it, she, Lacey asks, what was life like for you afterwards? And I know we're jumping ahead. And, and what was the hardest part about readjusting to life after liberation? Yeah, yet we are, we are still far from liberation, but once it happened, uh, then of course it was difficult to be told that my parents uh, and all the other people we knew and my Aunt Giza, whom I loved, uh, are gone forever. And um, uh, this is a picture of people who uh, who were present at my my parents' wedding. So now we are back in 1936. Um, when this when this photo was taken, 1936. Okay. Yes, it was taken in 1936 because that's when my parents were married. This is the p p picture taken at their wedding. Okay. Uh, after the uh, so after the. Uh, uh, the the ceremony ended, which uh, I have a lovely picture of my mother, uh, of my parents, of my mother in a beautiful white dress. They all changed their clothes, I suppose, and went out into the yard to have their picture taken. Um, so <clears throat> my parents are obviously the two people in the center on the bottom in the bottom row, uh, with the grandparents. Uh, my mother's parents on one side and on the other side i don't know who the lady is next to my mother uh, but the the lady next to her is my father's mother uh, charlotte bash um so um most so here is a group of people 
uh, the ones in the, with the circles around their heads are the only ones who survived. Everybody else, um, everybody else was killed. Um, I should say that my grandmother, Charlotta, actually died of natural causes um, before being deported. Mm -hmm. But everybody else, including my little cousins, uh, Veras, Denka, Edita, they were all killed. Um, this, Go ahead, Dora. I'm sorry. Should I talk about the survivors? Yes. So um, the two surviving, uh, the two survivors, the two gentlemen to the right with the circles around their heads, um, survived as prisoners of war, German prisoners of war, because they served in the Yugoslav army at the time, uh, at the time of the German invasion, and they were prisoners of war. And as shot as such, they were released at the end of the war and returned. Um, and, uh, uh, okay. Uh, the we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, but what I think the most important thing you're sharing with us here and later you explain about the four individuals who, who did right. survive. So, this picture. Some of, so these people didn't return and that was the, yeah. that was the hard part at the yeah. end of the war. And of course, dealing with, you know, the, we, what are, where are we going to go? And that right. was of course after the war. So we are jumping ahead a little and, um, um, yeah. But there's there's 21 people in this photograph, and only four uh, survived. Survived. Yes. survived. Right. Let's, let's go back, Dora, to the time towards the end of the war. You are with Uncle Ludva and your brother, and you're in a you are in a literal battle zone. Uh, right. So the partisans um, uh, attacked Ludwig a number of times, and um, and uh, Ludwig was while it was being held by Ustasha and then the other way around at one time when the partisans were holding the town, the Ustasha attacked. And uh, so um, um, we found ourselves in, in, in a sort of a battle zone. And um, um, there, was, there were times when, when uh, the battle would be raging in the middle of the night and sometimes we were not uh, able to even go and hide. And there were times that I remember um, crouching in a corner uh, in, we had, a, it was an old house and, and the walls were fairly thick. So you were pretty safe if you were, you know, in a sort of a situation where you hide behind a wall. But of course the, 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 uh, the, the um, uh, bullets would be piercing through the windows. And there was a time when I cr I was crying in my room, and I un my uncle came to comfort me, and the bullet went it went exactly through the window into where he was because it we hadn't thought for everybody to hide in time. When we had the time, and we sometimes knew that a battle would be coming, we would go and spend time in our cellar. So uh, it was a basement by America. But by American standards, not a normal basement where you would just go in the house and you know go down the stairs. You had to get out of the house and into the into the cellar. We had a vineyard, so there were barrels of wine down there, and it was dirt floor and you know shelves with um, drying fruit and so on and frogs jumping around. But we had some cuts down there, and um, uh, there were times where we spent. Uh, quite a bit of time down there because because there would be a battle and uh, you didn't know who was going to win and in the morning we would peer through those small windows on high up near the ceiling of the of the um, cellar to see who was in charge and I remember the time that we still couldn't tell who, exactly who it was but we saw a, a cart's being driven by, pulled by horses, and they the carts were full of dead bodies. So, if you you we would emerge um, when the shooting stopped, and, and then hope that it would be the partisans in charge. And if not, you had to be careful to hide. There were times where the bullets were throw uh, running through, you know. Um, uh, coming through the windows and um, hitting the armoires, which we had. And um, so they were, after the war, they were all pierced um, with bullets and um, you took out the tablecloths or the sheets that were there and it was all 
um, as if somebody had taken little scissors and made little designs and then um, so that it was very hard to yeah. to, to live through that. And in, in Dora, of course, it did eventually end with the end of the war in May 1945. And so the war's over. You're there in Ludbreg with your uncle and with your brother. Um, uh, but there was more tragedy to come for your uncle uh, and for you. Um, but first, tell us about your uncle. He adopted both of you, right? Yes, after the war, right away when after we after he realized that my parents had perished and uh, neither would return, um, he adopted us legally, and um, uh, so in many places you can see my name as being um, Brancic. Uh, that was his last name um, until I was married. That was my name. Uh, unfortunately, my brother died very shortly after. In 1946, uh, in the fall um, of scarlet fever, there were three little boys that got scarlet fever in Lodbreg, and um, the other two recovered with time. And my brother um, succumbed and um, died, which was a tragedy. Um, it was extremely sad for me, but it was totally tragic to my uncle, who adored my brother and. Um, after all the losses, that was just a, another awful loss. Yeah. And Dora, of course, now um, you've you've gone from being under the Ustasha and and the, and and the Nazis, and now you're under the communist government. But you would continue to live there for uh, uh, several, a number of years, living with your uncle. Now, now he's adopted you. Tell us. I, um, in fact, we have a question from uh, Kay. Uh, who wants to know about what was the deciding factor that brought you to the U.S.? But before you answer that, um, let's go back to uh, what happened with the, several of those few people who did survive from your family, who did return, and that that's part of your story for, for what happened yeah, to you. And part of the reason how I ended up in the United States. Exactly, yeah. Right, so um, back to that picture, if we, if we could. Um, um, I mean the one before with my own my family. Could we go back to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is my uncle Ludva in the middle with his um, wife on top, and who did not survive. Uh, but the gentleman to uh, the the gentleman to the left is another brother of my father's who survived, and he survived. Uh, um, he survived by escaping into Hungary and with his wife and then getting on the Kastner train and then being in Bergen-Belsen and ending up in Switzerland. And he continued after the other two uncles uh, who came to see me, the ones from the German prisoner camp, prisoner war camp, they came to see me and they wanted me to go with them. And I had to make a decision whether I was going with them and they were leaving for Israel uh, to live there. and. Um, uh, and, or my uncle who, with whom I had spent the war. And I, age seven, said, I'm staying. So that's how I stayed. Um, the uncle to the left, the one who survived Bergen Bells and was in Switzerland, wrote to me, sent me packages from time to time during the communist era when things, even such a small thing, like a small piece of chocolate was very welcome. Um, and eventually um, when I was, uh, 16, he invited me to come, and because I was considered by the government as a um, victim of fascism, even though no one was leaving the country, I was allowed to leave the country and go and visit. And for the first time, I met someone from my family um, since the time that uh, just after the war. It was a very emotional um, <clears throat> meeting, and he had a lovely wife Magda and two children, Dani and Jakob, and um, and they said, well, why don't you come back? And this was the time, I was only, I only stayed for a month. And why don't you come back once you're a university student and then um, um, stay for longer and go to school here, go to university here. And that's what happened. And on the way uh, to uh, see him, or see them, the family, and go to University of Lausanne in Switzerland. On that train, I met a young man who is uh, who was American. I was just accidental meeting. Um, 
I don't know how much time we have. So I Pro can't probably, I, I wish we could spend a lot of time on this story of how we met and why we met yeah. and so on. But eventually he bet, went back to the States. Um, uh, he had been in India with doing a postdoc work and then eventually he came back a year later. We were married and that is how I came to the United That's States. That's how you came to the United States. Right. And um, before I ask a final question uh, uh, of you, uh, Dora, that must have been very difficult um, for, for you and for Uncle Ludva. And, and how did he handle that? Well, maybe we can go back to that picture now. With Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he obviously, it was just him and me. He never remarried and we had lots of, we had housekeepers and maids and things like that. And, um, but you know, he insisted that I learn music and go to a very best high school and um, that was available there. Uh, I went to another town and, um, and university and um, was, he was a wonderful, wonderful person. And he understood that this was going to be terrible because I'll be far away. On the other hand, he also understood they were still in the communist system. L life was difficult. And my going to the United States would be probably wonderful. And so we wrote back and forth and he said, if my uncle, my Swiss uncle, my mother, my father's brother, if he approved of my getting married and going to the United States, he would go along with it. And that's what happened. That's what happened. Dora, before I ask my final question of you for the day, we have one other question from an audience member that I think you'll really want to hear. And this is from Ivan, who's in Croatia. And mm -hmm. Ivan asks, can you still speak Croatian? And did you visit Croatian after you left? And greetings from Medimajur. Meji Muri, Evalda. Ivan, dobar dan, hvala na pitanju. Ja još uvek govorim hrvatski. What I said is, yes, hello, and I do speak Croatian. In fact, um, my coming to the United States Holocaust um, uh, Memorial Museum um, had to do with the fact that I do speak the language. And of course, I finished a year of university in Zagreb. Uh, so I speak the language and I read it and so on. So I came as a translator uh, to the museum when um, an archive came to uh, muse to, to our museum, um, which contained all the remaining documentation from Yasenovac, and that was after the second war in, in Yugoslavia. Um, Dora, I can only imagine uh, the, what you could share with us and what it was like for you to go back and read all those files, all that material from Yasenovac when you started doing that as a volunteer for the museum. We'll have to save that for another time. Dora, I do have one final question for you before we close, however, and, and that is, please tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you went through, what you experienced in the Holocaust, and the impact that you see, what you witness uh, telling your story means to other people. Uh, well, you know, after the war, um, for many years and even during my life here in the United States, it was uh, as if something, um, it was something that so many people who lived through that time didn't really want to talk about it very much and didn't want to think about it very much. We sort of felt it was behind us, it'll never happen again. But unfortunately, as I live longer and as we have witnessed what's been happening in the world, including um, what happened in even in former Yugoslavia um, in during um, the this past war of the 90s uh, when there was another genocide in Srebrenica and what's happening uh, everywhere and uh, the in recently the the rise of um, anti-semitism persuaded me that it really I I I it's it's up to me to um, to talk to to talk about it and to um, to talk about the past. Um, and it's almost imperative that I speak about it, and perhaps I could inspire someone to see that compassion and tolerance, uh, empathy, and respect for others is absolutely imperative. And that um, the only way that 
that we can go forward is to um, to minimize hatred and uh, turn toward one another in a humane way. And I, I find that when, if people understood exactly uh, the impact that um, hatred has on human beings and really think about it, that perhaps we could hope for never again, I hope. Dora, we are, we are so enormously grateful and privileged um, to have you continue to talk about this in the ways that you do and particularly sharing this with us today. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our donors. First Person is made possible through the generous support from the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. Dora, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to um, share with everybody that we will have a, another program in June. So please join us again on June 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with Holocaust survivor Albert Gary. When a neighbor threatened to turn in Albert's family, his mother asked for help hiding her children. Albert and his sisters were placed in separate boarding schools and survived. And we'll learn more about his life experience during the war in our next program. Thank you all so much.